So I heard Jay mention football. I, honestly, I have no idea what happened. The, apparently the Packers lost. Is this the playoffs already? Yeah. What? <laughs> oh my, I thought they were gonna win. Wow, apparently not. I wanna know, this is Super Bowl number, Super Bowl number 50 something. It's, it's up there, right? I wanna know, does anyone here know who was the runner up, who got second place in Super Bowl number 32? No one? E- Eagles, maybe, who knows? What about, what about I wanna know who was the 26th president of the United States? Who knows who, who the 26th president of the United States was? You do? Who was it? You could get to it at some point. Okay. Now, I, what about who was the third nation of the world that made it to space? Third nation to make it to space. Anyone? China, maybe? I, I, I don't know. Because the thing is, is we only remember first. Isn't that interesting? Who was the first president of the United States? George Washington. Everybody remembers that. Who was the first person to do powered flight? The Wright brothers, yes. Who was the first person to do a nonstop transatlantic flight? Merely Eric was the first woman, but lucky, lucky Lindbergh. He was the very first uh, guy or person to fly across the Atlantic. Who was the first person to, a, to circumnavigate the globe? Magellan, yeah, yeah. Who was the first person to walk on the moon? Neil Armstrong, if we actually went. If it's not, I mean, who knows, right? Maybe a big conspiracy. We don't know, but, but possibly it was Neil Armstrong, right? See, we remember first, the first person to cross the finish line in the Olympics, right? We remember the first, you know, who gets first place, the first person to come up with an idea. We remember first, but it's not just that type of first, but it's also what you do first matters. So if you're going to do a sequence of events, what you do first matters. Um, famous... UCLA, you know, Hall of Fame basketball coach, John Wooden. You guys familiar with John Wooden? He had a unique thing that he did first every practice. He would teach his college basketball players to put on their socks and tie their shoes properly. And you're thinking, these guys are in college. They've been doing this for a long time. Why would he do that? Because what you do first matters. And he believed to set the tone for where they were going, that's what he needed to do. And he has, you know, many championships, many wins uh, to demonstrate that he had a good method for doing things well. The first thing that you say in an interview can often determine the difference between a job and still looking for a job, unemployment. Uh, The first date can be the difference between a relationship and singleness for another extended period of time. Right? First matters. We call this the primacy effect. That when there are a sequence of events that you experience, you will remember what happens first most often. That's why we call it a first impression. Because it makes the deepest impression on you, on your mind. You remember what happens first. So let's pretend for a second that you're God. I know a lot of us think this oftentimes that we are God. Um, Pretend that you are. You're the God of the universe and you are about to enact your plan to change the course of history by becoming human. What do you do first? What's the first thing that you do? Because it matters. Because God knows that he created our mind, he created our brains. And and so if you are trying to alter the course of human history, you know that what you do first will be remembered, that it will matter, right? This is a big deal. Now, before we jump into what Jesus actually does first, let's look at the context of where we're at. So we're in a bigger series on the story of the Bible. And we looked at the very beginning, Genesis chapter one, and we said the story of the Bible through the lens of Genesis chapter one is the story of who? God, it's the story of God creating what and what? Heaven and earth to be unified or united under the rule of who? God and humans together. Yes, come on. Way to go, everyone. I don't know if you remember that or if you read it, but either way, you did a good job reading. Way to go. Now, this matters because God is committed to ruling heaven and earth together with humans. It doesn't go so well early on, right? 
Right? We as humans, we choose to rebel. We don't, we don't want to do it with God. We don't want to listen to God. We don't want to submit to God. We don't want to let him define good and evil. We want to define good and evil in ways that it benefits us. And that's what the first humans did. And so from that point on, the story of the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament is the story of the who? The Messiah. Which means what? Messiah, anyone remember? King. Well, Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, yes, and it means anointed one or anointed king. This person who would come and who would actually pass the test, who would defeat sin and death, and who would reunite heaven and earth. That's the story. And last week we talked about how the Hebrew scriptures is this incredible, intentionally designed work of art that has no ending. Because it's a story of God creating heaven and earth to be united and we get to the end and heaven and earth are not united. It's God committing to rule with humans and we get to the end and humans don't want to rule with God. It's the story of the Messiah and we get to the end and there is no Messiah. And so it's this unfinished symphony, this unfinished work of art that John picks up on and continues the story as the story of Jesus. Now the book of John the book of John has a very intentional purpose. John actually states it in chapter 20. In John chapter 20, he says, this is why I'm writing this. And he, he says it like this. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So, hey, I was with Jesus. I, I heard Jesus. I saw Jesus. saw interactions with him. I interacted with him. So I'm doing incredible things, loads of things that I chose not to write down. But... I wrote down some things for a very intentional purpose, but these are written, these signs are written so that you, we, us, all the people after him would believe that Jesus is who? The Messiah, the anointed king, the one that the Old Testament was pointing to, the Hebrew scriptures were talking about, the son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. So as we travel through the book of John, you, we need to keep this in mind because this is what John is doing very intentionally. Now, the book of John is separated into 16 parts, 16 different segments. And the first one is the introduction. And we covered the very first part of the introduction. And I put the word to describe the introduction as unfinished. Because if you remember from last week, John structured his introduction very intentionally to be exactly like the uh, introduction to Genesis, Genesis chapter one. And he left it unfinished with this unfinished Greek sentence that Jesus has revealed dot, dot, dot. In your Bible, it says him. We put that in because that's what he, he came to reveal, God. But John didn't finish the sentence, hearkening back to day seven, that is this ideal that was never fully realized. And if you continued on in your study, we're not going to cover it, but the second half of chapter one, you saw that it's about who Jesus is, that people look at Jesus and they declare something about him seven different times, seven different times, like Jesus is the lamb of God, he's the son of God, he's the son of man, he's, the, he's a rabbi, he's the king of Israel, he's the Messiah, he's Jesus of Nazareth. All these different things. And if you want to go back, if you haven't done it yet, I can encourage you to go back and study it and mark out in some way, shape, or form all those different things that Jesus is called, the ways that he's referred to. Because it's like this mystery that John is beginning to unpack. Because you think about this, in the Hebrew scriptures, it's like the Hebrew scriptures describing the Messiah was forming his silhouette. And, and, and Jesus steps onto the scene and he perfectly fits this silhouette. And then there's more detail though with Jesus. And John is writing out the detail of who he is, which in turn is what God is like. Well, now we're in a section of four different stories. We're going to cover them over the next four weeks, four different stories. And they're regarding different miracles or signs that Jesus does and these controversies that ensue after he does them. And they're surrounding four different uh, Jewish institutions, four important Jewish institutions. The first one is a wedding. The second one is a rabbi or is the temple. The third one is a rabbi. And the fourth one is a sacred well. And so we're going to see these things as we come to this, but we're going to start with the very first one. So I want you all to grab your 
Gospel of John. Or if, you're, you know, if you've got a Bible that you're making notes in, great. If not, this verse is going to be on the screen. But here's what I want you to do with this thing. I, I, I forgot. I apologize. This was my bad. I forgot last week to tell you to write your name in it. Because what I didn't anticipate that there would be people who took such good notes that they wanted to share them with other people so they left them behind. So like I could see like how great you did. And I, and I graded a few. Um, we had a lot of A's, a couple of B's and some other uh, letters. But, but just in case you do want to leave it behind for me to look at and grade, I want to be able to get it back to you. So write your name in it. And, uh, and we're going to keep using these every single week, okay? Okay. So let's start and let's read uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. I think it's page 12. Uh, Yeah, page 12. Chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. It goes like this. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. What's her name? Mary. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, yikes, For some of you, like extra yikes. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, right? Everyone deceives them, right? That's that's what everyone kind of does. It's the natural way. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. You read that and you think, well, that's a really interesting story. There's a crisis. There's a resolution. It's miraculous. It's, it's, what a great story. But on first reading, at least for me, for many, many years, that's all it was. It was just that, oh, Jesus did this incredible thing. Obviously, you know, he's got power. But let me tell you what, as you begin to study this passage, things jump out that are incredible. It's like there's a story underneath the story that John has graciously given us all of these hints and these details to look into the greater story of the Bible that will bring forth these incredible truths. Who here love to go to the dentist only because they had the highlight magazines where you could look at the picture and circle all the things that were hidden in the picture. That was me. It's the only reason I love the dentist, right? I would get to go, sit in the waiting room, pull out the highlights magazine, find the, the picture, and then circle things. Who never did this? Who was like, what are you talking about? I've been on my phone the whole time when I'm at the dentist. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, back before they had technology, uh, we had books with pages and pictures, and and we we did things, and we entertained ourselves, and it was fantastic, okay? (sighs) Well, that's what we're going to do today, and we're going to do that together. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put up an image. Oh, what's the one? Jay was so kind to, uh, to change his password for me um, so that I could get it. And, and the level uh, that he thought that I could handle was one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's, and I, 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 I did it. It was, it was great. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do something called observation. We talked about a person uh, last week, Sherlock Holmes, who loved to do observations. But he would do two things. He would observe something and then he would what? deduce, right? He would interpret that. Just real quick, we're not going to do any interpretation in this stage right now. All we're going to do is observe things. Now, there are two rules when it comes to observation. The first rule is you have to actually see it, okay? It's got to be there, right? We're not going to make deductions and jumps and and interpretation. We're just going to say, I see this. Second rule, anything that you see is a right answer. So there's no pressure, 
No pressure. Anything you yell out to me that is actually there is an observation. Great job. And so together we're going to do this. Now here are some just some things you might want to look for. Things that, that might be important. Things that like, I don't know, something that has to do with time. Something that has to do with location. Uh, things that are repeated. Things that are compared or contrasted. Uh, things that seem odd or random. Things that seem like excess detail. You have to remember, right, they had a limited amount of space on this papyrus that they would write on, and so they intentionally wrote things. And sometimes you think, you spent a little too much, too much time on this. Why would you do that? And then also remember, the greatest tool in our tool belt when studying the Bible is what? It killed the cat. What is it? Curiosity, greatest tool in your tool belt when you're studying the Bible. So we're going to use a lot of that. So here we go. I want you to tell me, what is something that you observe about this passage? What's something you observe, something that you see? On the third day, absolutely. We are going to underline that. And in fact, we're going to underline that twice because they are a great band. What else? What else do you see? Water jugs? Yeah, there were water jugs. There were, how many were there? There were Six, that's a lot of information, yes. And what we're gonna do with this, we're gonna get a little creative. We're gonna put, we're gonna highlight water with blue and then we'll underline um, six stone ones because water is blue, that, that, that's good. What else do you observe? No wine, oh, no wine. We are going to do this. We're gonna circle it in red. Where is it? No wine, and then we're going to draw a line through it because it says there's none. Uh, and you know what, then we're going to draw a, f a face that is frowning. No wine. Oh no. What else? What else do you see? My hour has not yet come. Yeah. Jesus states his hour has not yet come. Um, let's highlight that. My, no, hi, we'll underline it. My hour has not yet come. What else? Cana Galley, that's a location, yeah. Oh, what, what just happened here? Jay, I messed everything up. Whew. It's okay. That, that was a close, it was almost like we didn't have any wine. Yikes. Okay, um, uh, Cana and Galley, that's a location. So we'll do it in green, like the color of land, grass. What else? Okay, we, his mother, his mother what? She, she may have just been suggesting. We don't, we don't, there's, we're not going to write tone into there. We don't know, but we'll, we'll talk about uh, his, his mother. We'll, we'll say she was there. Uh, Jesus, his, his mother, the mother of Jesus. Let's put a square around that. Mother of Jesus. And then, you know, she, she says some stuff. They have no wine. Um, and then you were saying something? Do whatever he tells you. Don't you like the sound of that when people say that about you? Do whatever he or she tells you. I love it when people say that about me. Do whatever he tells you. Hang on, I'm going to highlight this. Do whatever he tells you. And then I'm going to, Audrey, what was that? I should use a squiggle. I'm going to do that next time. All right, next observation gets a squiggle on. Who's got it? Purification, yes, purification. We'll, we'll, we'll go with blue, and then we'll do a squiggly. I, I don't know if I'm going to do very good at this. Squiggly line. Shh, shh. Don't be mean to the pastor. What else? One last one. One last observation. Yes, there was about three of them, but I heard wedding celebration. So we're gonna we're gonna celebrate with yellow, and we'll draw a circle around wedding. Wedding, wedding, right there. And it's a celebration, so maybe we'll just do a little highlight in red. Make it a little festive. Okay. Now, y'all just did some Bible study. Give yourself a round of applause. That was amazing. That was incredible. We just studied the Bible. Now, here's what we're going to do. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go back and I'm going to highlight some things um, that are a part of the greater narrative, the story under the story that John is telling. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to look at the last verse in this section because what it does is it's John making commentary on the story, right? He tells the story and then he gives us some commentary to help us know what's important, what's going on. He says this in verse 11, this 
The first of his signs, Jesus did at Canaan and Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now that sounds a lot like another verse in John. What, what, what verse maybe on the screen? John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, the theme, the purpose of the book. Now, Jesus did many other signs. See, I put that in a square next to the other one that has a square because they're related, they're connected. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, these signs, right? These signs are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So we have a a lot of correlation here, right? We've got signs correlating, we've got believe correlating, and then manifest his glory is a lot like Messiah, a lot like son of God, right? We talked about uh, the glory cloud of God being in the tabernacle and Jesus tabernacled among us. We saw his glory. So John is being very intentional to say, hey, I wrote a number of signs. This one is the first one. One, it's the first Messiah sign where Jesus manifested his glory. So we need to pay attention because it's the first one. The first one matters, right? What we have is Messiah signs that should lead to belief and belief should lead to life. And here we have a Messiah sign, water to wine. We've got the disciples believed and then life, at least in that sentence, isn't so clear, but I think we see a little bit in the story. So here's what we need to do. We need to pull out our, our curiosity you got everyone ready to pull out your curiosity? You got it? You got your curiosity? So let's ask some questions. How is water to wine a Messiah sign? Now, don't get me wrong. Water to wine is impressive, right? Wa- water to wine is impressive, but Dionysius, you know, the, a god, you know, in a neighboring, you know, area right near the, there, supposedly he turned water to wine. So why is it a Messiah sign? And then secondly, what kind of life is being demonstrated? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to mark down on the third day, okay? On the third day. If you didn't do it before when we talked about it, do it now. On the third day. This matters. This is a time frame. It's a time detail. And if you had been reading the book of John over and over and over and over and over and over, and over like I've been doing, this would really stand out to you. Because in chapter 1, John gives us a number of time indicators. In fact, he gives us three of them. And here's how they go. John chapter one, verse 29, John designates time like this. The next day he saw Jesus coming. This was John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, then John 1, 35, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And then John 1, 43, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found. So what are you expecting? when you read about the wedding when John designates time. You're expecting probably one of two things. Either the next day. What was that? Yeah, the next day. Yeah, the next day. Or maybe we've had the next day, the next day, the next day. So what should the next day be? The fourth day. Well, the third one is the third day. You're right. But if there was another day after, it would be the fourth day. So I think mentally in your mind, you were expecting either the next day or the fourth day. But John intentionally says the third day. This is his way of putting it in all caps. This is his way of doing bold letters or underlining or italics to really draw your attention to this because the third day in the scriptures is hugely important. We could talk about Genesis chapter one, right? There are seven days and on the third day, something very significant happens. In Genesis one, verse two, God lays out three problems, three things that don't allow for life to exist in the way the universe is currently. The first one is there was darkness. The second one is the land was uninhabitable. It was formless and void. And the third one is there is this dark, scary, chaotic water. Those are the three problems, right? You've got darkness, you've got uninhabitable land, and you've got scary waters. Well, day one, what does God create? Light. He solves the darkness problem. Day two, what does God do? He separates the waters, right? He takes care of the scary water problem. Day three, what does God do? He causes dry land and plants to grow on the dry land. So now at the end of day three, the world is ready for life to exist, right? There's a space where life can now exist, thrive, and flourish. That's pretty important. Maybe John's talking about that. 
What about Exodus chapter 19? So in the book of Exodus is the story of God bringing his people out of where? Egypt, yes. And they cross the Red Sea on dry land and they're saved. God saves his people. And then he takes them while providing water and food for them up to Mount Sinai. And then there at Mount Sinai, he says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a promise with you. And I'm going to lay out the terms of the covenant. But what I need you to do before I do that is I need you to get ready. I need you all to go through these rituals of purification because on the third day, I'm going to come down. God is going to come down on the third day and we are going to make this covenant together. Now, when the prophets and the later writers look back at this moment, they talk about it like a wedding. Huh, that's interesting. On the third day, there was a wedding between God and his people Israel. What about Jesus? He talks about the third day. In fact, later on in this chapter, John chapter two, verse 19, Jesus said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? His resurrection. Yeah. On the third day, Jesus is going to rise from the grave. Now, Paul thought this was hugely important. So much so that in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I want to remind you again of what is of first importance. And what is of first importance in all of the scriptures is that Jesus died bodily and on the third day was raised. On the third day he was raised. So you have all of this packed into what John is saying. So let's let's look at this. On the third day there was a what? A wedding. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? I want you to mark wedding. Somehow, with a square or a circle, highlight it, underline it, mark wedding. Because on the third day there was a wedding, that matters. Hearkening back to the third day wedding of God with Israel, but also looking forward to another wedding. Another wedding that we're going to talk about. Now I want you to mark no wine, and what does this have to do with me? And mark them similarly. I did two lines, two lines under no wine, and two lines under what does this have to do with me? There's a problem, there's no wine, and Jesus asked the question, why does it matter for me that there's no wine? What is the significance of there not being any wine in me? I mean, could it be that Jesus is saying, hey, I'm not a conjurer of tricks, Right? I'm not here to impress people. I'm not here to change the basic laws of nature the way that God has ordered the cosmos. Is that what Jesus is saying? Maybe he's saying I'm not at the beck and call of anyone but my father. Maybe there's something else. Maybe there's something more that Jesus is saying. What does a lack of wine have to do with Jesus and his messianic signs? Right? John said at the end, verse 11, this is a messianic sign. So why does no wine have anything to do with Jesus and his messianic signs? Hey, this is curiosity. We're like, well, I, well, I wonder, why, why does this matter? Why is this significant? Well, one way that it might matter is throughout the scriptures, wine or an abundance of wine is viewed as a blessing from God. We see it in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. This is a sign of God's blessing. But also, it's a messianic sign of the abundance that the Messiah will bring. So I want to go back to the the very first time this is prophesied. Uh, Jacob, if you guys remember Jacob, Jacob had a bunch of songs, uh, sons, sorry, it's in a song, many of you have sung about it, but Jacob had a bunch of different sons, and his third son, who knows who Jacob's third son was? Who sung about it? Come on. Judah. Did you sing about it, Josh? No, you just knew because you know the Bible. Who sung about it knew that it was Judah? Jacob, Jacob, yeah, yeah. So Judah, here's what, uh, here's what uh, Jacob's doing. He's prophesying over his sons. And he's saying, hey, here's what's going to happen for you and your descendants. And when he prophesies about Judah, he begins to talk about the Messiah who will come from his line. And it goes like this. Genesis chapter 49, verse 8. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Judah is a lion's cub. The scepter, that's what a king would hold. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So 
the anointed king, the Messiah, has to come through the line of Judah until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. So this is a big deal. And then he goes on, he says this, binding his foal, that's some sort of donkey, to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vestures in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Now just quick question. Let's pretend that we right now are experiencing a famine. Okay, there's just not a lot of food. Particularly, there's not a lot of wine, not a lot of grapes, not a lot of vineyards. But you just so happen to have one incredible vine that's just filled with the best grapes ever. Where are you not going to tie your horse? To that vine, right? You're not going to tie your donkey to the choice vine because he might trample on it. He might break it. And then, then you have no choice vine, right? There's no way in an area of famine, in a world of famine, you're going to do this. So what must there be if you're like, oh, where should I tie my donkey? Oh, just to that choice vine over there. What do you have? Abundance. I mean, you must have so many vines of grapes that are fantastic. They're just like, ah, oh, you just tie my donkey over there. Now, if you have a, you know, a lack of wine, what are you not going to choose to wash your clothes in? Probably ever, but just in this scenario, wine, right? Because there's not enough. Why would you do that? But if you have so much wine overflowing, it's like a, you could wash your clothes in it. So this is the prophecy, right? The Messiah is going to bring about an age of such abundance that you're going to be able to tie your donkey to the choice vine. You're going to be able to wash your clothes in wine. He's going to provide abundant wine. Now, let's go back to those purity jars. How many purity jars were there? Six. And how, how much did they hold? 20 to 30 gallons. Now, now, that's a lot. Have you, have you ever done the thing where you have the filter in your refrigerator and you've got to like filter out six gallons before you drink any? And it takes like a year. You're thinking, how long do I have to stand here to get six gallons? 20 to 30 gallons, that's a lot. I can't even imagine how long it took the servants to fill them. I mean, when Jesus says, hey, fill those things up. And they're like, oh, are you serious? We'll be here for a week. Because they didn't have just a faucet of water, right? They had to go take them to the well, fill them up, bring them back. This, this was a long process. This was a big deal. 20 to 30 gallons each. Now, some of you may be math geniuses, and you've already done the math in your head to figure out how many bottles of wine that would equate to. But I went ahead and did it for you. I'm sure we all know. So just, just to kind of confirm what you've had in your head. If a bottle of wine is 750 milliliters, and you've got on the low side six jars that each have 20 gallons, you've got about 605 bottles of wine. Now, if it's on the high side, if it's 30 gallons to the brim per uh, per jar, you now have about 905 bottles of beer on the wall. No, I mean, sorry, bottles uh, of wine, right? That's a lot. How, I don't know how many of you have planned a wedding recently and have had to account for people who like to drink wine at a wedding and you were going to provide that and you had to figure out how many bottles do we need? Well, I did a little research uh, and, and if you're going to have a wedding for 300 people, and you're going to have an average amount of wine. You'd probably get about 150 bottles of wine. If you wanted to be generous, you'd get 200 or more bottles of wine for your 300 guests. Well, a wedding like this was much smaller than 300 guests. And by the way, they had already had a lot of wine, right? Because the, the, the master of the, of the feast said, hey, you give the bad wine after they've already drinking. They've already drinking and now you're giving good wine. So Jesus provides between 600 and 900 bottles of wine to a group of people who've already drunk freely. Like, what's going on here? When the Messiah comes, there'll be so much wine that you can tie your donkey up to the choice vine. When the Messiah comes, there'll be so much wine that you can wash your garments in wine. This is the first messianic sign that Jesus performed to say, I'm him. I'm the Messiah. I'm not just a conjurer of tricks. I'm the Messiah, the anointed king who will provide and bring about an era of generosity and abundance that you can't even fathom. Now I want you to highlight or underline or circle or put a square around. My hour has not yet come. 
my hour has not yet come. What you'll notice as you continue to read through the book of John, the phrase my hour or his hour or the hour is very important. It'll come up a lot. It'll come up all the time. I just want to point out five different instances so we can begin to see what's being talked about. When Jesus says my hour, I mean, it sounds like a cryptic phrase. Hey, Jesus, there's no more wine. What does it have to do with me? My hour hasn't come. You're like, okay, what does that mean? Well, verse 21 of John chapter 4. The hour is coming when worship will change. John 5, 25, the hour is coming when the dead who hear will live. They'll be resurrected. John 7, 30, they tried to arrest Jesus, but his hour had not yet come. So now Jesus' hour is connected to his arrest. They couldn't do it because it wasn't his hour yet. John 12, 23, this is a couple days before he gets arrested. Jesus says, the hour has come. For the Son of Man, which is his favorite title for himself, to be glorified. And then John 17, 1, Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. This is now the night of his arrest and betrayal. What is Jesus' hour of glory? His crucifixion. We talked about this in Matthew. It's Jesus being raised up on the cross between two thieves. That is his hour of glory. So John, intentionally using the details of the story that Jesus spoke, said, hey, I want you to connect this very first sign to his last sign, which is his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, why is John doing this? Why is John showing this. If we think about the book of Matthew, and you think about why did Jesus perform miracles according to Matthew, right? What is Matthew trying to demonstrate with Jesus's miracles? Well, one is that Jesus is actually bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Another thing is he's trying to demonstrate the upside down nature of the kingdom of heaven, how he gives these great miracles to all the people who were far out and and excluded and marginalized and overlooked and and weren't invited. He's like, yeah, you're in, you're in. uh, Someone who has leprosy, you know, this unclean skin disease that kept him far out. Or uh, Peter's mother-in-law, who was a woman who was, you know, considered second class in that day and age. Like, no, no, I'm, I'm for you, right? Jesus was inviting all these people in and with his miracles, he was demonstrating the upside down nature of the kingdom of heaven. But in John, he does miracles for what purpose? To give witness to the fact that he is in fact the Messiah. So, what is Jesus providing wine? How is it connected to his death and resurrection, his last sign? So these jars, these jars were for what? Purification, the Jewish rites of purification. So they'd use them to, you know, wash their hands and their feet. They'd also use them if anyone had become unclean to help purify them so they could be clean. These were utilized in the purification rituals. And Jesus takes this purity water and he turns it into what? Wine. And then John connects this to his hour. His hour is when he's arrested and crucified. Before he's arrested, he's with his disciples and they're eating. And he takes a cup. And what is this cup filled with? Wine. And he says, now this is not wine. This is what? My blood. He takes purity water, turns it to wine. John connects it to when he takes wine and turns it to his blood, which does what for us? Purifies us. Purifies us. This is incredible what Jesus is doing. He's demonstrating the abundant generosity that the Messiah, he is bringing about, but the means to the abundance goes through his death that gives us his blood, which purifies us in giving us a way to be a part of his family. This is brilliant. The story underneath the story is incredible. It's not just Jesus doing a magic trick turning water to wine. It's Jesus saying, I'm the Messiah. This is what I'm bringing about and the cost of it is my very own life. Now there's another connection. I want you to write down or mark out, you have kept the good wine until now. You've kept the good wine until now. Now it could just be that Jesus created the best wine around. But maybe there's more to it than that. 
I wonder why John decided to include this detail. The book of Isaiah, chapter 25, we've got a messianic prophecy. Chapter 25, verse 6 says this, Now the Lord of armies will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain. A banquet of what? Aged wine. What's aged wine? It's the good stuff of aged wine. Choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will destroy the covering which is over all peoples, the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. How good is our God? Do you see what's happening? Do you see what John is doing? By selecting these specific details, he is making sure that we know, because of the primacy effect, what is most important for God for us to remember. The very first sign that Jesus performs is a sign of the lavish generosity that God wants to give out to us. The overabundance that will be a part of the great wedding banquet of the lamb with his people, all the people who have been washed and purified by the blood of the lamb. Just in that story, God wants you to know, he wants you to remember that he desires to celebrate with you. He's a God of celebration. He says, remember that I want to celebrate with you at this incredible banquet and I think about that, and it's hard for me. It's hard for me to imagine that God would really want to celebrate with me. Because when I think about my life, one, I've got a history of not being included in things. You know, as a kid. And sometimes I look in the mirror, and I'm still that kid that wasn't invited. I'm still that kid that wasn't included in the group. I'm still that kid who walks into the lunchroom and doesn't know where he's going to sit because all of the tables are occupied. All the groups are already put together, and I've got to go sit by myself. Sometimes I'm still that kid. But even if I look at my ledger, I look at the things that, that, I, that I've done, the people that I've hurt, the things that I've thought, I mean, the awful things that I've thought, the horrible things that I've done, and I think, at best, God is frustrated with me. At best. At best, he's angry with me. But what I see in God in this story in particular, is God saying, I'm not angry at you. I don't, I'm not here to destroy you. What I want to do is celebrate you. So I'm here to provide a way so that you can be pure, so you can be righteous, so you can be washed whiter than snow. And yeah, it's gonna cost me my life, but that's how much I love you. That's how much I wanna celebrate with you. When I look at you, I see my beloved son. When I look at you, I see my beloved daughter. I see someone who I am making a way to be a part of my family. Like the prodigal son, God runs to us. He embraces us. And then he puts on his choice robe. And he puts on his signet ring on our finger. This is my son. This is my daughter. Go kill the fattened calf. We are going to celebrate together in honor of Jesus and what he did. You're God's guest of honor in the celebration of his son and the wedding feast of the bride with his groom. That's what our God is like. Now maybe you're like me and it's hard for you to imagine. And so my encouragement to you is throughout this week, just take time to think about God wants to celebrate with me and just allow the spirit of God to sink that into your heart and your mind because that's the incredible God that we worship and serve. There's this phrase that um, many of us have heard. I heard it first uh, watching TV far too late and an infomercial would come on and, and someone would say, you can have all this, but wait, there's more. And it was silly, and if you watch QVC, you hear it all the time. But that's the gospel. 
The gospel is the gospel, but wait, there's more. That's what kind of God that we serve. He's this God that provides over and abundant beyond what we could imagine or ask for. And there's always more. And you think like Jesus dying, that was enough, right? That, that should have been enough. Him forgiving us, that should have been enough. Him inviting us into his family, that, that's enough. Him wanting to partner with us on his mission, that's enough. But what we find over and over throughout scriptures, there's more, there's more, there's more, because that's the kind of God that we serve and love. And we at Life Point Church have experienced the overabundant generosity and provision of our God. We, we really have. Um, we talked about this in December that we had the opportunity to do something like unheard of that we had the opportunity to pay off in three years our building loan of over a million dollars. And by God's grace and his generosity through y'all and your generosity, we together as a community did that. Like it's, it's done, it's over, it's, it's finished, it's paid for. How incredible is that? I mean, for real. You, I mean, do you know how many churches are in debt in America? Over 30% of the churches in America don't have anything in their savings account. Like if they didn't meet, you know, generosity that week, they'd have trouble. And yet God has provided for us. One thing that shocks me about God is that he cares about things that in the scheme of the universe don't matter that much. I mean, I think about all of the prayers that he's answered for me that, that, that are just, they're, they're so small. Now to me, they're big, but in the scheme of humanity, I mean, they're small. And I think about a God that would care about a small church in Quincy, Illinois, in the Midwest of America, and would be so kind and gracious to provide a way for us to be debt free. I'm, I'm blown away. So I'm going to invite the band to come back up, and we're going to sing together about the goodness of God. And what's going to happen is you're going to see this slideshow continue to roll. And each picture is a memory. Each picture is an instance of God's goodness. And you think about him providing for us at the main center, him providing for us at 18th and Harrison, him providing for us at John Wood, him providing for us here. And you think about the, the extravagant like life change that God has made in the hearts and minds of kids, of students, of adults. Like God is doing great things here today, right now, and he's done so many things, and it's important that we stop and we remember, that we look back at what all he's done. And, and really, you'll get to see just a couple of great pictures of Chris Woodard with a goatee looking like a youth pastor, and it is fantastic. So enjoy, and let's sing about God's goodness together. Oh, you know. 
God has been good to us, Life Point. Amen. So good. And again, are you laughing at me? No, I'm sure there's something up there. Um, again, the cool thing is, is that we get to come together and we get to be reminded of how God is at work, sometimes in the present. We can lose sight of that. Um, but to be able to come together and be mutually encouraged in him um, with our brothers and sisters of the faith is just such an incredible gift that we have. Um, I want to send you out with this. Feel free to stick around if you want to watch. I'm not sure where it's at. No, there's a lot to see still. So uh, I, want to, I want to send you out with this verse. This is G these are Jesus' words. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people put a light of a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and gives light to all of the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. God bless you, church. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to the opportunity to see you again soon.